Hi, now welcome to Fly Fishing Stillwaters, Coronamid Techniques. I'm Grant Fines, executive producer here at Sport Fishing on the Fly. And you know, when Brian Chan joined us a while ago, it was natural for him to do an on the bug segment during some of our episodes. And then we sat down, we started to brainstorm a whole bunch of different ideas of what we could do. It just seemed natural. The first thing to do though, was a video on Coronamid. You take Brian's background in biology, you take his and Don's ability to read a lake and to catch fish using coronamids, take our video production company and the abilities that we have to create videos, put it all together, and you come up with the video you're about to watch. 70 minutes full of information and full of some great videography. As you're watching this over and over again, because you're going to need to to absorb everything that's in it, pay attention to some of the underwater shots because you'll see in the sides of the screens there's some coronamids coming off. You might miss them the first couple of times through. Well, sit back and enjoy fly fishing still waters. This is the first of a series of shows we're going to do. This one on Coronamid. Not a great place to start off the video it would be at one of our little favorite lakes here. It's got really nice chronomid hatches and some big fish. But to start off the video, we should explain what a chronomid is. Well, chronomids are insects, and uh, they're in the order Diptera, which are two winged insects. And the adult chronomid looks very similar to an adult mosquito, except the female chronomids in the adult form don't have the long proboscis okay. to bite. And so they're, they're two winged insects that are very plentiful in many of our local lakes. Coronamids have always been one of my favorites to fish, for sure. I've always had really good luck with coronamids. Why are they such an important food source for fish? Well, they, Don, they're such an important food source because their numbers of species and their relative abundance is so large. In North America alone, there's been over 2,500 species of coronamids identified, and there's still lots more to be uncovered. Wow. The other thing is, when there's a coronamid hatch, there's not just a couple hundred or a couple thousand, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of them emerging at the same time. So they're readily available, there's lots of them in the water, they actually have a very high caloric count to them, oh, okay. and um, they hatch from almost the day the ice comes off the lake to the day the uh, lake re returns with ice cover. Wow, so the fish can really put on some, some meat. They can put on a lot of uh, meat and, and the other thing is that they're so easy for the trout to feed on because they're helpless in the water in the, in the larval and the pupil stage. When I'm tying a lot of fly patterns, a lot of people tell me, hey, you got to make sure you cover all the different stages of the chronomid from the larval all the way up to the adult. What is the favorite stage to feed on for the trout? Well, certainly the most available stage or part of the life cycle for trout to get at is the pupil stage because the pupil are rising off the bottom of the lake and elevating the surface and then hatching. Okay. So the pupa certainly get the lion's share of interest from the trout, but trout also like to eat the chronomid larval stage when they're in the bottom of the lake in the mud or the silt. And they also eat the adults as they're emerging and particularly when the females come back to the lake to lay eggs late in the evening or early in the morning. But the main stage again is the pupil stage when they're rising up very easily. S simply up. because there's just hundreds of thousands of them coming up at the same time. Before we head out onto the water, I think we should review the life cycle of the chronomid for, for everybody. So that's a good point, Don, and certainly what viewers want to first understand is that chronomids have a complete metamorphosis or life cycle. Egg, larva, pupil, and adult stages. Okay. And trout will eat the larval, pupil, and adult stages. The way the life cycle begins is females with fertilized eggs will come back to the lake late in the evening or early in the morning, usually when the water's calm, and they'll release their fertilized eggs. They'll dip the tip of their abdomen in the water, and they'll look like a float plane trying to take off. They'll make a V in the water. The eggs sink to the bottom of the lake, so they could be sinking in 5 feet, 10 feet, 20 feet, 50 feet of water. Right. Once the eggs settle on the bottom, they'll hatch between 5 and 7 days later into an almost microscopic chronomid larval stage. That larval stage quickly establishes a little tube or a cocoon in the mud water interface at the very bottom of the lake. As it grows, it'll continue to build onto its tube, or if it gets too big, it'll completely build a new tube. What anglers want to understand is that chronomid larvae are predominantly two colors, the maroon red color, which we call bloodworms, 
um, and they have a hemoglobin-like substance which allows them to live in very oxygen-poor water. But there's also another common color of Cronwood larvae, and that's green, olive green to a medium green in color. So you'll get olive green to medium green chironomid larva as well as the bloodworm coloration. When the chironomid larva is fully developed, and it's usually a one-year life cycle, although the big bombers that we see in the lakes will be a two-year life cycle, once the larva is fully matured, it'll seal itself inside the tube or cocoon that it built and then transform from the larval to the pupal stage. As the chironomid larva transforms into the pupa stage, the whole process of changing into the pupa will occur inside that old larval case. So you'll have the white gills at the tip of the thorax and you'll also have gills on some species at the tip of the abdomen. When the pupa is fully developed, it'll cut itself out of the old larval tube and start to rise or elevate to the surface of the lake. And the process of rising to the surface of the lake is aided by gas that's trapped under the thorax and abdomen of the chironomid pupa. And as the pupa gets closer and closer to the surface of the lake, it gets shinier and shinier because of the gas buildup. As soon as the pupa then hits the surface of the lake, a split will form on the back of its thorax and the adult form will emerge, dry its wings and immediately fly away to mate and complete the cycle and start over again with a new generation. Well, that's just great. Well, there you have it. You have the whole life cycle of the chironomid. And what I think we'll do now is we'll head on the boat, head on the water, and try to show everybody the different chironomid techniques that you can use for casting. Sounds like a good idea. Good. biggest questions I have in my travels by other people is how do you approach a lake? Well the first thing you want to do Don is look uh, for the amount of shallow water that the lake has, look for the shoals and you'll see that's where 95 percent of the insects are going to emerge and that's where the food's going to be so that's where the trout should be swimming around is on the shoals or on the edge of the drop-off where it gets quite deep into the deep water zone of the lake. Okay and another thing too is a lot of people go to a new lake and they say geez I've gone out I've looked for the shoals I can't find any shoals. Do most lakes have shoals? Well, most lakes, particularly small lakes, have shoals. And the rule of thumb is the more shoal area the lake has or shallow water it has, the more chance of that lake being productive enough to grow lots of vegetation, to grow the habitat for the food and the trout to live. Excellent. Well, what we should do now is hop in the boat, head on to the water, and show everybody how to anchor up and find a good location to catch some fish. That sounds like a good idea. See any more? We saw a few when we were coming in. Oh, there's another one there too, right there. Yeah, I'm marking a few fish on the sounder, Don. And that's perfect. How deep are we right now? We're in 17 feet. 17 feet. Right here? Sure. And I think we're we're seeing quite a few fish moving in here. What we've done is we've motored up into this area, and we've turned the motor off. And as you can see, Brian's on the oars, oaring us in. I think there's a big thing to be said about stealth. Certainly, in this real clear water like this. The motor's certainly going to scare fish, so ore power, let the anchors down nice yeah. and slow and uh, try to keep noise to a minimum. Excellent. So we're in about, uh, like you said, 17 feet, 15 feet of water right now. That's right. We'll drop the anchors. Now a good way for us to check is obviously we have a depth finder. Finder. That's right. Which makes it real easy. Makes it easy or you can mark your anchor ropes in five foot interview, intervals or one foot intervals to find out what depth Right, which in. I do when I'm on my flow tube or my belly boat. So I'll just mark them off. Makes it real easy when I drop That's right. down. So why don't we anchor here now. Really important again is something we like to stress is two anchor system. That's right. You know today there's two of us fishing in the boat and there's not too much wind obviously but two anchors means the boat isn't going to move despite the wind coming up and switching direction. The most frustrating thing you can have is one anchor out the bow, two people in the boat, and the wind changing direction and trying to concentrate on your cast. You have no control over your retrieves. Right, and also another important note is whenever you do have wind, try to keep that wind to your back. That's right. It's just going to make it easier on the forward cast and uh, you're going to get a lot fewer wind knots. Plus I find that when you get your fly out, when we fish it, we can fish it sideways That's and allow it to swing with the wind. Wind drift. And right, wind drift and then straight down with the wind, making it easier to cast. That's right. So why don't we drop anchor and you bet. do some we'll fishing. We'll put them down. Well, we've 
dropped the anchors. We're sitting in a real nice position, but what makes this area so special? Well, besides seeing the fish moving in here, yeah. we're anchoring, we're on the edge of the drop off and we're gonna be casting onto the shoal. Okay. And there's quite a number of chronomid casings on the water and adults sitting on the water. So we know there's some chronomid activity occurring. And there's that's some very action. important to see some chronomids. I mean, if you come out in the lake and there isn't chronomid activity, are you still gonna be able to catch them with chronomids? Uh, you got a lot more confidence if there's actually chronomids emerging okay. in the area that you're fishing. And also you mentioned something about the shoal. You said that uh, we're off the shoal. What is a shoal? How would you explain it? Well, shoal? basically the shoal on a lake is uh, that area of the lake from the edge of the lake, from the shoreline out to where you get the steep drop-offs okay. or where the sun can no longer photosynthesize. Okay. And usually that means shoals are about 20 to 25 feet in depth or shallower, or shallower because beyond 25 feet in depth the sun can't penetrate and the shoals as you can see on the bottom of these it's got that lush vegetation yeah. growing on the bottom which creates all that habitat for all those insects that the trout like to eat exactly now in that shoal area in that say one foot to 25 foot uh, zone that's where all the chronomids or all the insects live isn't it like the majority that, that's where 95 percent of the food sources of trout live or emerge and so that's where the trout have to, that's the grocery store, that's where the trout <laughs> are going to come to eat. Exactly. So you get chronomids, you get dragons, damselflies, shrimp, you get it all. You get it all. Perfect. All oh. on that shoal water. <laughs> there's fish rising, they're splashing around here. They're We've here. Seen them. Let's take some casts, see if we can get some. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> right on. Here's a real important thing to remember when you're letting your line out too, is especially when you're chronomiting, straighten that line out. When you're going out, and getting ready, spool a bunch of line onto the mat. We've got some nice rugs on the bottom of the boat here. And all I'm doing is straightening the line, just slightly pulling on it just to straighten it because if you want your line out there and it's all kinkled, you're not going to be able to detect a strike. If it's nice and straight, you get a better feel for That's it. That's right. You've got to have the whole idea is a straight line connection between the rod, the fly line, your leader, and the fly. And the other thing you want to always remember is when you're actually fishing, yeah that you want to keep your rod tip right on the edge of the water. You don't want to hold your rod tip high in the air because that forms a belly in your fly line. And it's a shock absorber. You're going to get a strike and you're not going to feel it. You know what we have here? So we've got, we've got a lot of fish moving in there. That's right. But the conditions are real tough right now. We've got, oh, he's by it. She's flat calm, oh. bright sunlight, gin clear water. There's some nice fish There's there. some nice fish and we're trying to crown them in. And these are the situations where it gets really tough to chronomid fish. Because the fish can see us, we can see them, it's bright, it makes it for real tough fishing. How do you, over, how do you overcome something like this when you're in a situation like this? Well, there's, there's so many different chronomids hatching today, Don. We've got to try to figure out which color they're eating first. They're definitely eating. You can see them swimming oh, they are. all over and turning and picking things up. We know they're not eating shrimp because they're not rooting on the bottom. Yeah. So they are probably keen on chronomids right now. They're keen on a chronomid, but I think what would be better for us if we got a breeze. A little bit of riffle, Just, and that's, that's a great note. You know, Brian stresses the fact of a breeze. I always, when I'm chronomitting or talking to people, I always tell them, if you've got a breeze or ripple on the water, it's just ideal. It's perfect for chronomitting. Again, it makes it tougher for us to see the fish, but fish can't see us as easy. Well, I think what we should try to show everybody now is a little bit of throat pumping. We'll actually throat pump the fish, see what he's been feeding on, and then we can change up flies and uh, try to get some more. So there I'll uh, get the net for you. Now what we're going to do is try to show everybody the proper way to use a throat pump. I know a lot of people don't use it properly, and you can really damage the fish. So Brian's going to show everybody how to use it, and I've got the little the bottle ready for the contents. You bet, Don. Using a pump improperly is certainly going to damage the fish. The first thing you want to do is obviously keep the fish in the water, and then take the throat pump and lubricate it, but get all the water out of it so okay. that the pump is now moist inside. Cradle the fish in the water, depress the bulb, slide it in until you feel a narrowing of the throat. It depresses, pull it out, and you get the last few food items. Excellent. And you can let the fish go. Oops, there we go. And we'll put the fish in the water. Okay, ready to go. Come on. There he goes. All right, well, there's a little vial. I'll give you the little vial. So we'll just put some water in the vial. 
and we'll take the pump and voila and we'll close the valve obviously this guy's eating chronomids and what we got in there are green ones and maroon ones and maroon and the silver with the red stripe yeah silver with the red stripe yeah wow That was we just switched over. We, yeah. We looked at the vial and just changed over and went with the silver with the maroon rib, with that red rib, which we saw in the vial. That's right. <laughs> the vial does not lie. It tells nice all. Nice fish. Oh, Ooh. that is. Nice fish. You know, crown meeting is just a fantastic way to catch a, a ton of fish. And I hope the video helps everybody to, to crown them in a lot better. I know a lot of people compare it to watching paint dry, <laughs> but it can be very rewarding. It can be it's, effective. Uh, yeah. And usually you're going to get a lot of the big fish in the lake. You know, that, is that a misconception no. there about big fish not eating chronomids? Big fish eat small flies. When you think of chronomid hatch, hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, not just hundreds of them. Yeah. And how do you it's think the fish item. get big? That's right. They eat lots of them. Lots of them. So did you want to pump this guy again, Brian, or not? I think we're probably pretty good, Don. We're pretty good, okay. Do... Boy, and there is the size of fish that'll feed on chronomids. Right there. there. Beauty. That is, nice you know, that's a post-spawn fish, but still very healthy. Rainbow, we'll just, there he goes. Wow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the chronomid I caught that guy on. And he is right here. This, I, this one could be, another candidate for the bench. It could be. You know, we might get into this one a little later, but these are, what do you call these ones? Um, chromies. Chromies. They're just basically a silver tinsel body and a red rib, um, but it imitates, as the coronary pupa gets closer to the surface, it traps more and more gas under its thorax and abdomen, mm -hmm. and they get shinier and shinier, and that's what the silver does. Oh, so that's what happens. So actually, we are fishing a little closer to the top. I've got about four feet of line on. And that fly is near the top. That's I right. guess they see it as it's getting that chromey color to it. It stands out a little bit more, a little bit different than the real guys. And yeah. Yeah, because I know I tied this one too with a little bit of holographic tinsel. And I don't know if that adds a little extra gleam or not, but it's it a, hurts. That, that much more flash to holographic versus straight silver. Yeah. And this one also has a silver bead, as you can see right here. And it's got a little red butt. <laughs> and that never hurts either, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> What we should get into now is talking about this method of fishing with the strike indicator. A lot of guys, when they are chronometing, will use a strike indicator. And I know we like to when we're a little deeper water. So what would you say about your setup right now? Yeah, well, I think the reason why we went, finally went to a strike indicator here, Don, those fish are really picky. And uh, we're fishing gin clear water. And um, we know the depth they're in because we've yeah. got it marked on our depth uh, sounder and also on our anchor ropes. Okay. And, just using the indicator allows you to suspend a fly in a, exactly at a depth and not move it um, horizontally or vertically. And the only way you'd move it is just to give it the odd twitch, just to, uh, just as a fish actually, in this case, sees it because the water is so clear, we can actually move the fly when a fish comes close. Okay, so we're actually covering a horizontal zone, like Brian said. If you have that indicator on, the fly suspended, suspended directly below that, that's right. All you're doing is moving that fly horizontally. Ever so slightly. That's Just right. Just tweak it up a bit and then let it sit. Tweak that's right. it a bit and let it yep. sit. And that's a really good effective way to fish, especially covering that horizontal zone. If you know the fish are feeding in say four to six feet of water, you can suspend that fly down from that strike indicator to that level and you cover that whole zone where they're feeding. That's right. Usually, especially too, because we're fishing such clear water, it, it makes sense for a fish, particularly big ones, in real clear water to feed closer to the bottom than to the surface. Because exactly. the closer the surface they get, the more uh, susceptible they are to predators exactly. like ospreys. And that's a, and this is a really neat method compared to the wet line technique where with the wet line, we bring it directly vertical. Straight up. And cover that whole vertical zone. So you get fish feeding in much in deeper zones, water. Which Absolutely. we'll show a little later in the video. So that's a real good tip for you everybody bet. to know, especially with this method with the strike indicator. So what we're going to do now, head into shore and actually go through the whole setup with you. The line, the rods, the whole setup, leaders and everything else. You bet. Well, we've come to 
shore and we're going to show everybody the perfect setup we're using with the indicator type chronomid fishing we're doing. We're going to first start off with the reel. We've got a nice little Marriott reel here with some reel fly line on there and about 50 yards of backing. And I prefer the wave forward lines on this reel. And I know you like the wave forwards also. Wave forwards are really the way to go when you think about when we're doing a lot of floating line chronomid fishing, we're often casting long distances and the wave forward lines help you get that distance. And what's, what's wrong with the double tapers? Is there anything wrong with the double taper? Or? No, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that you can get more distance uh, with the weight forward line. Okay, excellent. And really on my fly line, I like these new bare tooth type uh, braided uh, connectors. Right, the They're braided They're a very loop. nice thing. What they do is they go on to your fly line. They're a nice braided connector and they look like this. And they're real easy to put on. You just braid your fly line through there. They have a nice little heat connector on them, heat shrink material. You heat shrink it on. You could even put a little, little crazy glue on That's there. That's right. And they hold really well. Yep, and you just get rid of that bump that the nail knot leaves at the end if you're using a nail knot. So it's smoother going through the guides when you're playing a fish. Next is the leader. That's right. It's obviously a pretty important part of the whole setup, Definitely. Don. And what we've got here um, on this first leader here is just a straight nine foot leader. So for instance, if you're fishing shallow water, five, six, seven, eight, nine feet in depth, and using the indicator system, all you would need is a nine foot leader. Okay. But if you're anchoring in deeper water, 12, 14, 15, even up to 20, 25 feet in like depth. Like we were today. Like we were today, then you're gonna need at least like a 15 foot long leader. And this particular one ends in 5.8 pound, which allows you to add on extra tippet to make this leader quite a bit longer. And the advantage of these long leaders is that they have a heavy butt section, which allows the fly to turn over, which is really important when you're fishing those long leaders. You want to make sure that fly is going to turn over uh, because you're waiting so long for that fly to sink. If it's all tangled yeah. up, it, the, the whole cast is for naught. Okay. So we've got short and we've got long and leaders. Long. Perfect. Onto our leader then, we like to put some tippet material. Sure, Don. And the reason why we add tippet is to obviously uh, lengthen our, our leader length, or if you keep retying flies on, your, your leader is going to get shorter and shorter or too right. thick, so you have to add some leader onto it and tip it. And this real power flex is, is strong, relatively clear, yeah. and uh, by using either double or triple surgeon's knots or a blood knot is how you would attach more tippet to your leader. Okay, and I, I know you mentioned clear in there. One of my favorites is the fluoro flex, it's called. This is actually the fluoro carbon that Rio makes. And it has a real low refractive index. I think it's a little lower than water or very close in the water. Close. That's so right. it makes it really clear in the water and I think it's a transparent to fish or almost transparent. Certainly in conditions like we're fishing today. Right, and I swear by the fluorocarbon. I mean, we stress it on all the shows and I'm really sworn into this stuff. Probably one of the most important things in this setup is the strike indicator. Certainly, the way we're fishing today, you needed yeah. something to keep our fly suspended at a very particular depth zone. So what kind of indicators do you prefer? Well, there's, there's a whole variety out there, Don. First of all, we've got these turn-on indicators that uh, you can just pull apart and then twist the, the rubber core, and that cinches them down into a, and they stay in a very precise position. Okay. And then we've got, uh, you can use poly yarn indicators, uh, which have a little less resistance in the air. And I find they're good, but I find they sink a little bit. I, you have to gunk them up almost. With that's right. And, and if you're using tungsten bead-headed flies, then you probably want to go back to something a little exactly. more uh, buoyant. And then I like to use just um, corkies, which steelhead yeah. lures, and they come in a wide variety of sizes and colors. And uh, they're uh, using a, a round toothpick yeah. to peg it or using a rubber band to peg it. And then there's also BioStrike, which is a... Um, a soft putty okay. that uh, uh, biodegradable that you can form into a round ball and then pinch pinch it onto your leader okay. and uh, it stays in that position. And the last one here um, is these uh, real uh, Kahuna strike indicators, which are really just a painted styrofoam, yeah. uh, and they come with uh, the little uh, toothpicks and you stick them in, break them off. And the reason I like these is for the name only, Kahuna. You're like going to catch a big name. fish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And last but not least, we have the weights. That's right, uh, a little bit of extra help to get your fly down quicker, uh, down to the depth zone that we want to suspend that fly below the indicator. Okay, and I know we use a lot of tungsten beads, me and Brian both tie with a lot of tungsten beads and some other beads that help to, to get that fly down. So if you do have a heavily weighted fly, you probably don't need a weight. That's right, but if you're using just unweighted flies without yep. beads, certainly uh, if you want to get them down a little bit quicker, um, either using the... Uh, okay. 
the deep soft lead, the Loon uh, Outdoors uh, non-toxic okay. synthetic lead, and you mold it around your last uh, tippet knot, okay. and it'll stay on there all day long. Perfect. So it works out really well. Or if you want to get down even uh, faster, uh, you can get uh, packages with a variety of sizes of split shot. Okay. And uh, just be careful, you want to pick the good shot that's real soft, real lead. Well, there it is. There is that setup that we've shown you for the strike indicator method of chronometing. But you know the most important thing of this whole setup? It's the flies. It's the fly, exactly. So you know what we're going to do is we'll head back out in the water, see if we can match the hatch again, maybe show you another throw pump, see if we can get some more fish. That's right. Good idea. <laughs> want to stress in the video is how the hatch changes through the day. So we've shown you some chronomids that were hatching earlier. Now what we'll do is do another throat pump on this fish here and see if that hatch has changed. You bet. And that was what actually got us on to these certain type of chronomids. We're actually using a, what do you have on right now, a maroon? I've got a maroon one on. Maroon one with on. a silver we saw, rib. We saw the silver rib and the maroon color in the last batch. And we'll actually see if that's what this guy's still feeding on. Obviously he took Brian's. Gee, he's dancing. Okay, flip them over across here, keep them in the water. What I have here is the last sampling. We've got a, a maroon one and a green one in here. That's right. Let's, let's give this a throw pump and see how it's See changed. what else is, yeah. see whether it's changed or not. See if the hatch has changed a whole bunch. So, okay. get the net so we'll do the same thing, we'll lubricate the pump, but get all the water out of the bulb. Keep the fish in the water, beautiful fish. Press the pump, slide it in, and then slowly pull it out. Okay, and then we can let the fish go. Oh, there he goes. Oh, that's interesting. The, the majority of uh, chronomids here are green. Green. So they've changed from a maroon ones to green ones. And there you go. That is, that's a change of the hatch right there, isn't it? Unreal. That last fish that you caught was feeding on a lot of maroons oh, and some greens. That's right. This guy seemed to be king on the greens, but he took your maroon. Unreal. And there, is there any maroons in there? Yeah, there's a few. Green? There's maroons. a few maroons, but there's a lot of greens in there. So there is a couple of hatches going on. Right now, it's not unusual to have multiple coronamid hatches. Oh yeah, three or four, five different species within a four or five hour period. And that's the challenge is that they keep switching back and forth. and. Uh, that's why if you do a throat pump on a fish properly and get some food items that are just in the throat, you can really help you uh, figure yeah. out where the hatch is going that particular morning. There's some great knowledge for you. And I know there's 2,500 different chronomid species you were saying? Yep, there's 2,500 species that have been identified in North America alone. So there's probably a lot more. And I guess what it comes down to for fly fishers in still waters, it's color and size. Oh! It's oh. <laughs> coming up again! Oh, look at him go! Oh, Hot this fish. guy's on a mission! Hot fish! Just bar chrome. Let's see what you, what he had in him. Look at him. Maroon. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but look at a lot of maroons, but there's again, some green there's ones. greens. Yeah, there's there's probably 60, 40 maroons to greens. But and he took your green. But just, you know what? They seem to be like all day today. They've been on greens and maroons. That's right. They, back and forth. Back, back and, and forth. forth. And I think I mean I caught them with the maroons. You caught them with the with the greens, vice versa. So I think, but they have been picky. They've been picky, but doing the, doing the odd throat pump certainly um, at least confirms that uh, they're eating either of those two colors. Yeah. And you're, you're going to increase your odds so much by just getting a sample like this once in a while. That's right. Yep. Because if you don't and you don't know, you know, how are you going to catch them? I mean, you could spend the whole day fishing a chrome yep. or something else and, and not it's really totally know. off, yeah. yeah. And if you do the, do the throat pump properly, um, 
it's not going to do any damage to the fish. And Keep them in the water for the whole process and uh, they're back away. And just let them go. That's right. Fantastic. Why don't we go to the bench and tie up a couple of the favorite patterns that we were actually using right now. I know the maroon one is one of your favorites. There's certainly a, a maroon with silver gold ribbon in a 14. Yeah. And then uh, obviously that last fish we caught uh, had olive green ones in a 14 to 16. So All right. those are two we probably should try. Excellent. What we'll do is we'll go to the bench, we'll tie up a couple of flies so you can see exactly the way we tie them and use them here. And then we'll come back and maybe show you a different uh, fishing technique. We've come to the bench to do a little tying. And I think a real good one to start off with would be the green one that we had, that we got from the throat sample of that, that fish. That's right, there was a fair number of the green ones in the, in the samples we uh, had a look at. And what else did we see in there? Certainly saw a fair number of maroon with silver rib. Right. And uh, I'll tie that one after you. Good. And I think the best way to approach it so people can see the fly being tied is we'll do it separately. And that might make it a little easier. That's right. The first fly we're going to tie is the green beadhead chronomid. We're going to tie the green beadhead chronomid on a size 14 TMC 2487 hook. We'll use some 8 odd all thread for the body. We'll use some small copper wire for the rib, some peacock curl for the thorax, a 3 30 seconds gold tungsten bead as a bead, and some white antron for the gills. I'm going to take some white antron yarn and just tie it in at the very top, right by the eyelet, and those will be the gills. I'm going to whip finish off my thread right now because what I'm going to do is take the fly out of the vise and put the bead on. An important note when you're putting your tungsten bead on, the tungsten bead has a real wide end and a real narrow end. Make sure the wide end is pointed towards the eyelet. So my tungsten bead is tied on. Now I'm going to wrap on my tying thread and wind back to the butt of the hook. I've taken a small strand of my copper wire. And this is small, fine copper wire. And we're going to wrap it into the body for the ribbing. We'll now take the thread and slowly wrap a body and the whole body will be made up of this nice green thread. So just, again, taper it, keep it fairly thin because chronomids are quite thin. And work it up, a nice little body all the way up to the bead. The thread is now tied in for the body. We're going to take our small gold wire that we had for the ribbing and take about three to four turns at the butt of the hook and then make about five to six turns to make the ribbing on the body of the fly. For the thorax, we're going to take a one peacock curl, tie it in by the butt, and slowly wrap around just a few turns just to give it a nice little bulging thorax. Finish the fly off now. I'm going to whip finish the fly just behind the bead. And we'll cut up our thread. And now we're actually going to take the gills that we've created on the front and just cut it to the right length. We're going to cut them about an eighth of an inch long. It's the small little, small little gills on the head of the fly. There it is, finished little green chronomid. This chronomid is very common throughout still waters in western North America. And Brian's coming up next and he's going to tie up a maroon chronomid that is also very common in these waters. As Don mentioned earlier, there's a lot of maroon chronomids found in productive western still waters. So the pattern we're going to tie now is a good representation of that particular species. For the hook, we're going to use a Tiemco or Mustad curved shrimp hook in a size 16 to number 10. For thread, we're using 8 dot maroon. For the ribbing, it's fine silver wire. For the body, it's maroon super floss. The thorax is peacock hurl. The shell back 
is cock pheasant tail fibers and the gills are white ostrich hurl. So we're going to start off with I've got the maroon tine thread laid down on the base of a Chiamco 2457 uh, shrimp pupa hook and a size 12 that's in the vise right now. The rib for this fly is going to be fine silver wire. The body of the fly is maroon super floss. And I'm going to tie it in, in near the eye of the hook and then pull on it and then tie it down. Bring it back to the bend of the hook. Then I'm going to stretch the maroon super floss and form a body with it, winding it forward from the bend of the hook. Then I'm going to take the fine silver wire and I'm going to wind it forward as the ribbing, but first give a couple wraps at the, at the bend of the hook and then there'll be six to eight wraps of the tinsel as we go forward. Then we're going to take some cock pheasant tail fibers for the shell back. And I'm tying the, the shell back in first with the butt sections pointing away from the eye of the hook. Then I'm going to take my white ostrich hurl for the gills, tie the gills in four turns. Tie it off. And take a strand of peacock curl, tie it in behind the gills, and this will be the thorax. I'm going to take the cock pheasant tail and fold it back over the white ostrich and the peacock curl to form the shell back and use the tying thread to tie it off. And then I'm just going to use a, a hand whip finish with the tying thread to finish the fly. And that's the completed maroon and silver chronomic pupa. Well, there are a couple of generic flies you can put in your fly box. They're going to work well for chronomid pupas. And I think the green and maroon are fairly common colors. Real common colors in many western still waters. long leader without the indicator, what do we use? Well, certainly we're starting off with uh, most likely a weight forward floating line. And today we're using nine to 10 foot rods in five and six weight yep. uh, line categories. And then attached to the end of uh, the fly line, we used, um, we started off with these 15 foot heavy butted leaders that ended in six and a half pounds. Mm -hmm. And then we added considerable amount of tippet up to about another eight to 10 feet of tippet. But we use the heavy butt section to make sure that the whole leader fly, and then if we had soft putty lead on the leader as well, turned over properly. Right, and if you just go with a leader only, a lot of guys say, well, why do I need a leader? Why can't I just put on a string of tippet? If you don't have that leader on there, it's not going to lay out properly for it, you, is it? It's not going to turn over. It's just going to end up in a bird's nest down there. And so 
That's why you have to have the tapered leader. Now, as far as rods, we we're talking, we're using five and six weight rods and also matching it with the line, with the fly line. Say we were to put a, a line weight heavier on the rod, do a lot of guys do that? A lot of uh, rods are designed that, uh, that allow you to load one line heavier. And so a lot of anglers um, that are trying to get distance will often put a uh, okay. line one higher. Is there any advantage to it or is it just more the, the man thing, getting the bigger distance? I think if the, the good rod manufacturers design the rods properly uh, for the line weight that they tell you. <laughs> okay, so try to match it. If you've got a six weight rod, try to match it with that six weight line. Casting these long leaders can be pretty tough, I know. And do you have any tips for the people out there on casting these long leaders? Yeah, Don, certainly uh, playing with these long leaders, you want to make your casting loop a little bit wider than normal. Normally we're trying to get a nice, tight, narrow casting loop, right. but in this case we want to make it wider just so that our flies stay well away from the fly line, particularly when we're using bead-headed flies or weight on your tippet material, right. that we stay away from the fly line and we don't get those nasty wind knots or bird, bird's nests when the fly so gets tangled. So keep in a nice wide open loop. Open it up a little bit, nice and slow. Excellent. So you know what we'll do is we'll head out in the water right now We'll go out there, we'll do some casting, and we'll actually show you how to do these nice wide open loops. Sounds good. Good. All right, Bry. This is a beauty. This On the illuminator. The illuminator. It's a winner. But oh, that's all. Jumping trout. What we should do. Oh, jeez. Oh, gee. What a fish. Oh, mad now. Oh, boy. Whoa. Let's get this guy in. Look at that. Right in on the nose. Him. Right on the nose. In the beak. Okay. Hold your rod for you. Now, here's another thing that we should bring up as we're we're throat sampling, is where do you normally hook a fish with a chronomid? Like I know the majority of my hookups have been in that upper lip. Upside down in the upper lip. Why is that? Do you have any ideas? No, I think, well, obviously when, when you're feeling, when we're feeling the take, the fly's already on the way out. Oh, it is, fish's yeah, mouth, and right. it's catching in the upper corner on the upside of the mouth. A lot of people don't realize that, that, that I mean, you're staying in really close contact with that fly at all times, that chronomid. But that fish just swims by and picks it up ever so gently. That's why you have to really be in tune with that fly at all times. And again, barbel hooks very easy to remove from the fish. Just pops out. And there he is. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. fish, Bri. Beautiful. Oh. Rainbows are king, aren't they? Beautiful. Nice fish. We well, let's see what the uh, let's see what the throat sample has to give us this time. So we got a vial full of green with red butts and uh, maroon and silver. And maroon and silver. We did have some luck with the maroon and silvers. That's but, right. But it's, they've really been king on the illuminator. On the, the red, green. the green with the red butt. Yeah, that's right. The other thing we should we should point out to the viewers, Don, is that all these are small food items, and so that's what these throat pumps are good for for mayflies chronomids, small shrimp and that. Okay. When the trout get feeding later in the summer on big food items like dragonflies and leeches, you're not going to be able to get those items no. into the into the uh, orifice of the pump. And so uh, trout pumps are really good to use in the early spring and early summer when they're eating these small food yeah, small items. Food items. What I want to do now is show you a little bit of how to fish this method, this long leader floating line technique. And we want to show you some different retrieves. And I think the best way is for Brian to explain some of the different retrieves now. How would you retrieve this fly in? Sure, after, after we've waited uh, maybe a minute, minute and a half for the fly to sink because we were in 20 feet of water, the idea is to get that fly down as close to the bottom as possible and then start a very slow either hand twist retrieve like this a nice little figure or eight. Or figure of eight. It's very, very slow. 
because all we want to do is pull the fly very slowly, actually horizontally, okay. but keeping the fly in a very narrow depth zone. Okay. So the slow hand twist or figure eight retrieve, and then it's always good to intersperse your retrieves with a couple quick pulls like that. Or if you're uncomfortable doing the slow figure eight retrieve, you can do a nice slow strip retrieve like that. Okay. But keeping also, it real a, slow. A key note that we should mention too is our chronomet is heavily weighted. We do have that tungsten bead on there. So really, like we showed you earlier in the setup, it's that nice long leader, 20 to 30 feet, plus that weighted chronomet on the bottom. And I think something else we want to explain is how is the fly actually moving in the water now that we're, we're retrieving it that certain way? That's we're right. Covering that horizontal zone, how is the fly actually moving? How does it look in the water? That's right. It's ideally, it's just moving um, head up, tail down, okay. but moving very, very slowly horizontally. And just kind of undulating in the just water. Just undulating, just like the real uh, chronomet people are doing. So we're really covering that horizontal zone. That's right. We're, we're trying covering yeah. a vertical zone. No, we're trying to find a very narrow zone where the fish are actually staying, uh, because I think most of the time the fish stay in a narrow zone versus going up and down in the water column. They, they find a zone where they want to eat, and that's where you want to get the fly. What about water temperature? Is there, is there a key time when chronomet activity starts? Yeah, the, the, the most, uh, most of the major chronomet hatches usually don't get going to the water, to the surface temperatures of the lake gets around uh, 48 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Once, once the surface temperatures are that warm, it's usually warm enough down deeper. And what anglers really want to remember is that chronomets come in a whole wide variety of colors. Right. Black ones, red ones, maroon, green, brown, orange. Silver, yeah. So they're all different colors, and fish aren't colorblind. And well, fish aren't colorblind. No. Now, there, there's a misconception. A lot of people think fish are colorblind. No, they definitely can discern uh, shades of colors. Well, they can. And uh, we've been finding fish on, obviously, green and uh, maroon and silver and that, but it could have been black, it could have been orange, it could exactly. have been brown. A whole variety of colors. But that water temperature, 48 to 50 degrees uh, at the surface, uh, well, really is, is the trigger point for major hatches to occur. Okay, so that's the major hatch, and that's usually going to come normally a week to two weeks after ice off, is that? Yeah, depending on general? whether it's a warm spring or a cool spring, but two to three weeks after ice off, you're going to be in shape for, for some good chronomet activity. Now, does that chronomet activity, as the water warms through the summer, does the temperature get really warm on the top, obviously the yeah. water gets warmer. The most uh, intense hatch is, you know, 50 degrees to uh, about 62, 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And above that, uh, they start to thin out. Well, he's got a little scuff on him, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you do the honors. Thank then. you. Flies out. Let's just show everybody that fish. Hey, it's quite nice. Yep. Good looking fish. Nice looking fish. Go through the hatches of the day. What's happened? Yep, yeah, started out green this morning. We're um, green with uh, red butts. Red butt, yep. Yeah. And then we switched over to maroon, and now we've gone over to brown. Yeah, to browns. And there was the odd silvers too, the yep. odd chromium. The odd chromium there. So that's four really good hatches through the day that have come off. Pretty interesting. The big key. I mean, that's what I. That's what a lot of my friends call the fresky riffle. The fresky riffle. The fresky riffle because I just have zero confidence when it's calm. I just have no confidence. Oh, you and me that, both. As soon as that riffle came up, bang! I hit this guy. And it's for the past hour, me and Brian have. You know, we're being relaxing. We haven't got anything. As soon as that riffle came up, I got this guy. I just can't believe it. So uh, we just want to stress the fact of the riffle, when you got that wind coming at you. Oh yeah. Keep it to your back, cast down wind. Mask us from them, they can't see us, we can't see them. Hold them up, and I'll swim away. And there he goes. What we should do now is, we've done quite a bit of the fishing out here, we should head into the bench. And I think I'm gonna tie that fly that was so effective this morning, that new one that 
that uh, you and I... The bright green and red. Bright green, the one that you named. The Illuminator. The Illuminator, that's definitely one of my favorite patterns now, so we're going to tie that one. And then I'll leave it up to you to see what you want to tie. Sure. We've seen a lot of browns, we've seen a lot of chromies. I know you've got a great chrome pattern. Yep, and brown ones, maroon ones, so there's quite a choice to choose from. Good, well let's go to the bench and we'll tie up another couple of flies for everybody to see and you'll have a whole variety to pick from. Sounds like a good idea. Good. Well, we've just come off the water and we saw some unique things today. Well, we were fortunate to catch a few fish today and to do a couple of throat samples to see some different colors of chronomids that was probably worthwhile to come back to the tying bench. Yeah, and I found one that was very original out there, quite a unique fly, and we're going to be tying that a little later. But uh, I think you're going to go with one of your old standbys? I'm going to be tying a chromie, which is a chronomid pupa pattern that imitates a pupa that's very shiny, trapped a lot of gas under the thorax and the abdomen. Chromie was originated by Phil Rowley, an innovative fly tire from the lower mainland of British Columbia. Why the chromie works so well is that it's a silver fly and as you recall when the pupa get very close to the surface of the lake they get shinier and shinier and so this fly is an excellent imitation of a chronomid pupa getting close to emerging the adult phase. The hook is a size 16 to size 10 Tiemco or Mustad curved shrimp pupa hook. Thread is 8 aught black. The ribbing is fine red copper wire. The body is medium silver tinsel. The bead is a 332nd black tungsten bead head. And the gills is white antron. First step for this fly is to tie in a tuft of white antron for the gills. And I tie the fly off, cut the tying thread, and I'll now slip a black tungsten bead 332nd diameter over the shank of the hook. Retie my black tying thread in. Then I'm going to build up a base, a thin base with the black tying thread. I'm going to take my red, bright red, fine copper wire, tie it in at the bend of the hook. Then I'm going to take my silver tinsel in a medium width, tie that in for the body. wind it forward. I'm going to take my red copper wire tie in two or three turns at the bend of the hook and then wrap it forward for the rib. I'm going to take my peacock curl, which will be used to tie in a collar behind the black bead head. And then I'm going to use a hand whip finish to finish off the fly 
behind the bead. And then we trim the white gills to just underneath an inch in length. And the last step is to take some soft body or hard as nails nail polish and we're going to lacquer the um, abdomen of the fly, the body of the fly, just to add a little bit more protection to the fly and also add a bit more shininess to it. And there you have the completed chromie. Green chironomids are quite common in most of the lakes, but what we found during the filming of this video is one fly that really stood out. It was a chironomid pupa with a bright green body and a real red butt section to it. Brian and I decided to call this fly the Illuminator, so make sure you have these materials ready before you tie this fly. For the hook, we'll use a size 16 to 12 TMCO 2487 Scud Pupa Hook. Use some ADOT olive thread to tie with. We'll use some blood red thread for the butt, some green holographic tinsel for the body. For the rib, we'll use some small copper wire, some peacock curl for the thorax, and some white antron for the gills. To start the fly off, we're gonna tie in our red thread. And we'll tie it in right to the bend in the hook, and actually form up a small little butt section about an eighth of an inch long on the hook. I'm going to take my whip finisher and whip finish off the red thread. And we'll tie in our green thread, which we're going to finish the fly with. For the ribbing, we're going to take some fine copper wire and tie it in. And we'll hold that off the back for the ribbing later. The special ingredient to the fly is some of this green holographic tinsel. So we'll just tie it in right back to the red buck set, butt section of the fly. Take our thread forward and slowly wind in a body. We'll now take the copper wire that we've had sitting off the back and slowly make four to five winds to form the ribbing. We'll take our white Antron yarn and have it right near the eyelet and just tie in a small section, wrap it in and cut off the excess. Take some peacock curl, one strand, tie it in just below the white gills we just put in, and wrap in a small thorax. Just about four winds, and tie it off. finish the fly off, we're now going to whip finish the fly right behind the gills, snip up our thread and cut our gills back to just under an eighth of an inch long. So we have a small gill sack. Well, I hope you enjoyed those two new patterns because those are very innovative. That's right, and when you think about it, over 2,500 species of chironomids identified already, 
there's lots of opportunities to be creative at the tying bench. I think what we want to talk about now is the different wet lines you can have to use with the sinking line chronomid techniques. And I know we have a, a variety here. And That's I think right. We should start discussing them. My personal favorite that I enjoy using is this intermediate sink. It's a nice clear line, it has a real slow sink rate, and I'm able to get up onto the shoals and then allow it to come down through the shoal and then bring it up. So this is one of my favorite lines for sure. That's right. And one of my favorite lines, Don, is the uh, is a type three uh, full sinker, uh, density compensated or uniform sink, so I can get that line sinking at a nice even rate through the water column, and then I have the opportunity to pull it up on an angle if I want to, or wait for the fly line to sink straight up and down okay. in the depth I'm anchored in, and then pull it straight up. And now density compensated you were talking about, now that puts an even belly in the line? Yeah, that means there's no sag in the line, okay. that the tip section is weighted uh, so that it sinks uniformly with the rest of the line. Excellent. Another sinking line you might want to consider, Don, is, is a Type 4 full sinker. So it's a really fast sinker. This gets you down very quickly to that straight up and down or vertical position for retrieving those pupas straight up to the surface of the lake. So good, better in deeper waters. Better in deeper waters, saves you time getting your fly down to the zone. Well, talking about saving time to get your fly down, this is the ultimate <laughs> in getting your fly down. This is a tungsten dredger. It's, a, it's called a Deep 7 tungsten dredger. I used this once. And my fly, I was probably in 50 feet of water, and it took not very long not to get very down. Long. It is. It's really tough to cast. It's a very heavy line. But if you want to get that fly down in a hurry, it's one of the best. So if you had to have one line, one wet line for the sinking line chronomet technique, which one would you prefer? It'd probably be a type 2 or a type 3 full sinking line, and probably a uniform sinking line at that. Excellent. talk a little bit about retrieval. I know we've focused a lot on retrievals for each different technique up until now and I think it's important that we explain what we're doing here for retrieval with the wet line. Sure, well, so I've got the type 3 uh, uniform sink on. I've waited for the fly line to get straight up and down and then we're just going to be doing a steady uh, hand twist or figure eight retrieve all the way up. And I, I would pause once in a while, let it sit there, okay. but we're trying to imitate the real chronomid pupa as it's trapped the gas under its thorax and abdomen and floating to the surface of the lake. Now one thing about chronomids is down below when they're really low, close to the weeds, you're saying they travel very slowly. That's right. And then they, do they trap more gas as, as they're as, coming up? As they get higher in the water column, they trap more and more gas. Okay. And actually in the top three feet just before they get to the surface, there's quite a bit of wiggling and action. Oh, and uh, you see them pop action. right up. And they pop, yeah, they basically, it's pretty amazing because once that pupa hits the surface of the lake, they're out. It's almost instantaneously they're emerging it's in the amazing. adult. So they're ready. So remember that when you're using the wet line, if you're down nice and deep, bring it up nice and slow early. And maybe when you get to the top four feet, maybe a little your, more action. Yeah, it'll increase yep. your speed. And you can see also here's a, a fact is Brian's got his rod tip right in the water and that line is straight down. That's right. Like it is just it's vertical. I mean, we did pick up some fish casting out and actually having the fly swing through the other zone, but I think this is the most effective, having it pull straight up. Absolutely. Through yeah. the vertical zone. So look at that, right in the bottom left. Beautiful. Just fairly hooked. Oh, he's a dandy. That's a nice 20 incher, isn't he? Let this guy go here. What a beautiful fish. Boy, oh boy. That's what you can expect to catch on chronomids, right there, folks. That is a healthy rainbow. Just a beauty. Let's get him back in the water so everybody can see. Isn't that a pretty fish? Okay. All right. And he wants to go. There he goes. Well, you know what? Thanks for fishing with me. It's a great day on the water, Don. Thanks for doing the video. I hope everybody enjoyed the video. I think it's, uh, I think it turned out quite well. What everything we wanted to explain, I think we got in. There's a lot of information in there uh, for both beginners right through advanced uh, chronomid anglers and 
hopefully the viewers will pick up a few tips that will um, make their days on the water a little more enjoyable. Yeah, exactly. And I know you've got a whole bunch of information out there right now as far as books and videos. You just have a new book out? A new book out with Skip Morris that we uh, just released called Morris and Chan Fly Fishing Trout Lakes. Okay. And then currently working on a book just on chronomid fishing tactics. Oh, that's fantastic. And also, check uh, check your local listings for the show, Sport Fishing on the Fly. We air weekly all over the place, all over the world right now. And uh, look forward to some more videos we have coming out. I think we plan to do another one on leeches and maybe some water boatmen. You never know. Just have to wait and find out. Thanks again for watching the video. And particularly beaded head flies yeah. and your fly line so you don't get those wind knots and you don't get those nasty bird nests. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So it is actually the same family as mosquitoes? Exactly, same family as mosquitoes. Okay. It's just they don't bite. That's wrong. <laughs> Cycle the chronomid for the viewers. Sure, Don. And what we want to know, understand, what... Playing one at a time. Sure. And that way we don't get all bungled up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> bungled, bungled's the word. Is it? Yeah, it's kinkled. <laughs> saw some unique things today. Well, we were fortunate to catch a few fish and do a couple of throat samples to see some patterns of whatever. No, hang on. <laughs> Being out fishing chronomids, there's lots of opportunity to observe what the real ones look like and that crit and then we can, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'm going to say. I hope you enjoyed those flies because those are two very innovative pupa patterns. They certainly were and um, what was I supposed to say? I have no idea. <laughs> you, I thought you knew. They put a gun to my head, Granny. Like it, I got an eat more bar in my hand and I took a bite out of it. They made me do it. They weren't going to let me fish any more of the boat if I didn't. Now we have to tie him down on the trip home. He's Brian and Les both like eat crabs. I can't believe it. Yeah, they are good. The peanuts. <laughs> it's the peanuts that do it. Oh no. No, look at my line. Oh, rookie. <laughs> no. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, wow. How did that get? Look at, look at this. Oh, well, so much for that fish. He's still there. <laughs> this video is a chronomid that was a very great brain. Breen. 